A few years ago, while on winter break from my university, I was staying in my hometown with my family. I'd had an extended break from school, longer than my other friends in college, and I wanted to get out of my house. I had been speaking to a guy a few years older than me, and he invited me over to his place. I'd met him through a combination of mutual friends and social media, and I figured since he was friends with my other friends, he wouldn't do anything crazy. I showed up to his apartment, and one of the first things I noticed was a baseball bat studded with nails. He jokingly opened the door with it in his hands, and I started to get very nervous. All said though, everything ended up relatively fine. We watched TV, chat, play with his dog, everything seemed pretty normal. Almost boring, actually. We had sex and I left in one piece. He ghosted me for about three weeks after that, claiming he was sick or something. He ditched all the plans we had and I moved on from him. The night before I was to leave for university though, he told me he had found something of mine. A very, very important thing I had left over there on accident. I quickly drove over late at night in hopes to just grab it and go. I did manage to grab it, but not before he broke down crying, talking about how much he misses me. He clearly was upset I was leaving. Even though he was the one who had decided to ignore me for three weeks, he said he'd made a huge mistake by not seeing me sooner and flaking on our plans. It was all in all just extremely weird, and I was pretty uncomfortable. He went on to speak about his ex-girlfriend, how terrible she was, how I'm nothing like her, and he needs me in his life. I did my best to shut him up before skirting my ass on out of there. I remember laughing so hard the entire drive home because of panicked fear. The next day, I flew back to college many states away. A few weeks later, he started messaging me again. Normal things at first. How are you? How's the semester? I answered maybe 2 out of 20 texts. Those 2pm messages soon turned into 3am messages though. Those messages turned into frequent phone calls. At this point, I hadn't answered for months on end. Every time I thought he was done and he hadn't contacted me in a while, he would just start spamming me over and over again. I blocked him on everything, over and over but each time he found a new way to call or text or DM or whatever. He would always say these things like he loved me and missed me and he was going to come out and find me. He would be crying or drunk or somewhere in between. It was always all over the place. I felt safe enough though, since I was so far away, 1500 plus miles. I didn't think anything would come of it. It was always just a funny story to tell my friends. One day though, I was on the bus browsing Tinder, and guess who popped up? He had super liked me too, apparently one mile away from my campus. I started panicking. There was no way he was here. Mind you, this person knew no one in the entire state except for me. He worked in a restaurant. It's not like he would have traveled there for work or something. There was no reason for him to have come that far. Absolutely none yet here he was all the same. I frantically checked all my social media DMs, only to see a message from him on Twitter, even though he was blocked. He must have been saving this account to contact me on a rainy day. That really got me. Hey, for some reason, you hate me. I'm in your city right now, though. I was hoping you can show me around. I'll come find you. I texted my close friends to add him on Snapchat in hopes they could monitor his location secretly. As they were tracking him, he even ended up passing by my building of residence. Thankfully, he didn't find the exact area I was living in, though. He was by himself the entire time. He didn't post anything, he just walked around, apparently looking for me. For a week, I stayed locked in my room, terrified he'd try to bypass the dorm security and knock on my door or something. He did not end up finding me in the end, but you can be damn sure he tried. I wonder why he was in my city that week. Clearly, he was trying to hunt me down. It's not like he could have been on vacation or something. This is not exactly a city for tourists. It's definitely not like Los Angeles or New York or something where people are coming and going all the time. 
Generally, people who come to this city only do so for work, school, or family reasons. I don't know. I only knew this guy for three weeks, but he still thinks he loves me to this day, nearly five years later. Lindsay and I had been best friends as far back as I can remember. All throughout primary school, we'd always be in the same classes. She was practically family to me. Unfortunately, things began to change about the time high school started. I began to see her differently. I don't know why, but I became convinced suddenly that I loved her. I don't mean the way I always had, either. This was special. It's a confusing time for boys regardless, but my newfound love for her left me disoriented and scared. It was new and uncharted territory. Without advice from an experienced older male, I had zero idea how to proceed, or if I should do so at all. The answer came to me one evening, while watching an old movie with my parents. The lead character was in a similar position to mine. He talked about something called a secret admirer. This is when a person sends letters or notes to someone that they're interested in, but does so anonymously. This sounded perfect to me. I could tell Lindsay how I felt without her knowing it was me. That way, I could scope out how she felt without the possibility of ruining our friendship. Hopefully, she'd be attracted to her admirer, and I could then eventually reveal myself. I sat down at my desk that night and poured out my heart to her, or at least her secret admirer did. To be safe, I snuck out extra early the next morning and rode my bike to the post office. I kissed the letter for luck and said a short prayer, then dropped it into the box. It was all in God's hands now. The wait was agonizing. On day four, Lindsay mentioned the surprise that she'd gotten in the post. I played it cool, but my heart was pounding like a jackhammer. The way she talked about it was somewhat unclear, too. She would smile while recalling some things while also calling it juvenile and foolish. It was not looking good, but I was far from discouraged. I couldn't have walked away if I wanted to. Lindsay became my world, and I couldn't see any future without us together. I continued with my plan. With each new letter, I could see her warming up to this secret crush, as she put it. Looking back, she wasn't the only one that began to change, though. I began to love this power I had discovered over her. Hearing her speak about her admirer, and knowing she had no clue it was me. It was an intoxicating feeling. I'm a bit disgusted about how I viewed things back then, but it is a part of the story, so I do have to include it without leaving anything out. Before I knew it, a year had already passed by, and we began to drift apart. I kept up with those letters, but gradually I saw her less and less. Her popularity had increased immensely, and her friend group had changed as well. I was the exact opposite of popular, though. She didn't exactly ignore me in front of her new friends, but I got the impression distinctly that I'd slipped down on the list of priorities. I understood why everyone loved her. It did make sense. As long as I could spend time with her every once in a while, I was still happy. Then, though, I heard news she was seeing someone, and it felt like a knife in my gut. I wanted to be cool about it, but under the surface, I was livid. I feared the little time we still had together would evaporate. And that proved to be right. Every time I called her to hang out, she'd be busy with him. I maintained a cool facade, but it was just that. I often cried myself to sleep at that time. The truth was beginning to hit me. Her and I had no real hope of ever being in a real relationship. I'd pushed myself out of that by never acting upon my feelings, without even realizing it. Even then, I didn't stop the letters completely, though. On the rare occasion I felt optimistic... I'd sit down and pour out my feelings on paper. More than once, I'd tear up the letter because I mentioned something that would give me away right away. I was never mean to her, but I considered her boyfriend fair game, and that would be the mistake that unmasked me. I regret it to this day. In my last letter, I guess I'd said something too revealing. I wasn't aware of this until I ran into Lindsay's boyfriend. He said he wanted to speak to me privately. We met at a park near my house. He was already there when I arrived. 
I assumed he wanted to ask my opinion about a gift for Lindsay's upcoming birthday. I offered my hand as a greeting as I approached, but rather than shake it, he sucker punched me right across the chin. I crumpled like a piece of paper. He then stomped me square on the nuts. I'm not sure how long I was unconscious, but when I did regain a semblance of clarity, I felt a cold object against my neck. It was a knife, a sharp one. All he had to do was apply the slightest pressure and I'd die. I realized how badly I'd messed up. He proceeded to tell me he knew I was Lindsay's secret admirer and he would murder me if I ever spoke to her again. As terrified as I was in the moment, my pride wanted me to say no. That would mean the end to all of my dreams. Fortunately, I didn't listen. I reluctantly agreed and he put the knife away, kicking me even more in the side as he walked away. As anticlimactic as it sounds, that was the end. I'd had the fear beaten into me, and I didn't want another helping. The guy was a well-known psycho around town, and from that day on, everything was over. I'm not sure if Lindsay actually knew what had occurred, but she treated me as a stranger for the rest of time in school. Seeing her only made things more painful, so I did my best to avoid any place I thought she may be. Even after she and that particular boyfriend broke up, I kept my distance. The damage had been done. It's been 12 years since high school ended, and I still think about her often. I hope that whoever she chose to spend her life with will love her as much as I loved her back then. I just want her to be happy more than anything. Just after April of last year, I began getting messages from a phone number I didn't recognize. This was especially unnerving, as I'd only been in the area for a brief amount of time. Because of some problems I'll get into later, I'd essentially been forced to flee from my hometown in the middle of the night. Because of this, my number was a new one, and I could count those I'd given it out to on a single hand. I thought I'd been careful. I deleted the first few without reading them, but soon I thought better of this. What I found left me very ambivalent. It appeared I'd picked up an anonymous crush somewhere along the way. I was flattered by the attention, but not knowing their identity was scary. I was terrified I'd been located and began planning another move. As I was just days away from leaving, a new message arrived. It read this, Please don't be afraid. I mean no harm. In fact, the exact opposite of that. You brighten every room you enter, and my world is better by you being in it. I don't know you very well, but I sense something may have happened in your past. Please, allow me to help you heal those old wounds. I may not yet have the courage to face you, but I dream of a time soon when I may come to you, and we can get to truly know one another. For the sake of love, why not give me a chance? After reading that, I was at a bit of a loss. I'd never had another human being express their feelings in such an honest way. The situation was odd, but a part of me had been craving this type of attention my whole life. If you've never had a normal healthy relationship like me, you'll understand how beautiful words like this sound. It was the first time in months I could allow myself to relax and stop looking over my shoulder. It was uncharted territory for me, but I didn't think I had anything to lose in this moment. For the present, I'd stay where I was. My admirer and I traded messages for about two or three months, and everything was going well. The person grew more and more courageous until the day came that he suggested we meet in person. Many questions had yet to be answered, but he promised that this was the time. I knew the day had come, and even looked forward to it sometimes. That deep-seated fear of being discovered kept me reluctant, though. I had one female co-worker I trusted, and we discussed it. Her opinion was that I couldn't hide myself away forever. If I thought this person was worth a risk, I should try it. It sounded like a solid stance to me, so I let him know I was ready. We came to an agreement, and I began preparing myself for the meeting later that week. A strange thing happened on the day the date was scheduled, though. Just an hour prior, he sent a message claiming his car had broken down and suggested he get an Uber to my place. We could go out to dinner in my car. Up until this point, no one but my employer knew where I lived. The fewer who did, the better in my mind. When the message arrived, I stood and stared at the phone screen for a long time. 
I didn't know how to proceed. Something about this message bothered me. It seemed overly complicated and pointless. For a brief moment, I almost agreed, but at the last second, I came up with a better suggestion. I got a better idea. How about you take the Uber to the restaurant and I'll meet you there? If things go well, I can give you a ride home after. Had he agreed to this, things may have gone completely differently, but instead he continued on pressing. Some red flags were beginning to pop up. I'd really like to see you before we go out. Wouldn't you like to know I'm not a complete toad before wasting money on me? Come on, I'll be a good boy, I promise. The pushiness made me uncomfortable. It was unlike the previous behavior. My gut was telling me to cancel. I waited for a few minutes before I was to leave and sent a message saying I couldn't make it. I felt like a real tease, but I wasn't willing to risk my safety after all I'd gone through. He tried to change my mind, of course, but by now I'd convinced myself. After he sent two more messages, I got fed up and turned off my phone. I figured I'd deal with the fallout in the morning. What awaited me the next morning, though, was nothing short of terrifying. 22 missed messages, each one more desperate than the prior. It was the last one that made my blood run cold, though. You're smarter than I gave you credit for. You may have gotten away from me today, but it's only a matter of time before I catch up with you. I've already got your number. Your address is next. You can run, but I will find you. Then you're gonna regret the day you left. This was the day I'd been dreading for over a year. Neil, the person who'd sent the messages, was my husband, you see. We'd been high school sweethearts who married right after graduation. Everything went okay until he was laid off and began drinking heavily. This led to him abusing me mentally and physically. Things came to a head the night he beat me so badly I lost our child I was carrying. It was an incredible trauma, but he didn't seem to care. I knew right then the man I'd fallen in love with was God. A heartless psychopath had taken his place, and I no longer had anything holding me there. The next night, I waited till he passed out and made my escape. I took the little money I had and contacted a woman from the local woman's shelter. She had approached me earlier in the year and given me her card. She told me when I was ready, she'd help me disappear, and that's just what she did. The mistake I'd made was contacting my niece to let her know I was okay. That must have been where he got my number. His way of luring me in was certainly imaginative. I'd completely forgotten how manipulative he could be. If he wanted something, he'd use it to his advantage, and it came close to working. He didn't appear to know my location yet, but he was right. He would find me if I stayed where I was. As I had twice before, I threw my possessions into my car and moved on. I'm currently living across the country, far from where I was at the time. A lot of people reading this might wonder why I'm going through all the trouble. All I have to do is get the police involved, right? I did try that course in the beginning, but he violated the orders anyway and attacked me, which almost cost me my entire life. I decided to not try that again. Until he realizes I'm not worth his time, I'm willing to continue bouncing from place to place, putting down no roots. Even if I die single and alone, every moment I'm safe makes that worth it. If you ever find yourself in a similar situation, don't hesitate to reach out for help. It may mean the difference between life and death. This happened just last year, during my first year of university. Me and my school would go skiing during early December. I had a girlfriend, which we'll call Katie. Katie was kind and respectable, which is what I liked her for. We had been dating since high school and I knew at least three other guys that liked her as well. During the ski field trip, we would go for a week and come back. You could only come if you could pay for it, as well as provide gear and high enough skill. We were both pretty good at skiing, but not exactly amazing. We went on a few black trails in Whistler during high school, and had taken some lessons as well, so we felt we were ready. There wasn't anything wrong with the trip, We'd left school early at 6 a.m., so I was sleeping on the bus. We went there, got a great view, got into our hotels, and had some nice dinner. When we got back, it was already night, so we decided to sleep and go skiing the following morning. It was around 3 a.m. when I got up to drink some water. 
I realized there wasn't any more water left in my bottle, and the sinks were all really loud. I didn't want to disturb my roommates, so I went to get some downstairs instead. When I got my water and went back to my room, I heard a loud sound outside. It was coming from the same room that Katie was in. I didn't think much of it at first. I went back to bed, but after 30 seconds, I heard it once again. I was confused, and I went outside to check what was going on. I couldn't see anyone or anything at first. Then, though, I saw somebody climbing the ladder that led up to the roof of the hotel. I was confused. No maintenance worker would come out this late. I quietly asked this person who they were and what they were doing. They said they were Jerry Chung, a maintenance worker. They did appear to be carrying a bag of some sort, so I thought maybe they were right and went back to sleep. As I was doing so, though, I heard another sound. I went back to check, and there they were, on the balcony of Katie's room. I started to freak out. I couldn't quite make the jump between gaps, but I could make it to the ladder. As I was thinking about what to do, though, suddenly he jumped to my side and threw me onto the ground. He duct taped my mouth and tied my hands together. I was so scared. The balcony's doors weren't see-through, so no one could see me out here. He seemed to be in a hurry, so right after getting to my side, he knocked me out. Or at least, he thought he did. I pretended to be knocked out. I figured I might be able to get myself and everyone else out of this situation somehow. Thankfully, he'd tied my hands very loosely. When he went over to the other room, I quickly untied myself. When I jumped over, I saw him duct taping and knocking out Katie just like he'd done to me. He proceeded to try and take her outside. I was right next to the door though, so I quickly punched him in the face. I unleashed a flurry of blows on his head to make sure he was not conscious anymore and began screaming for help. I was badly bruised on my face and leg as I'd cut them while hopping over. I'd also been beaten up pretty badly. Katie was like me. Her face was badly bruised too. Overall, she was fine though, which was a big relief for me. The guy was apparently a stalker who'd followed her old Twitter account all the way back in middle school until high school. When the police came, he apparently even knew where I lived, where she lived, as well as both of our parents, as we were pretty close. He was extremely jealous of me and everyone in our school, as they got to be in the same school as Katie, so he decided to try and kidnap her while she was away from home. Obviously, he failed. I guess initially, because of my long hair, he thought I was her best friend or something, and changed his plan to try and kidnap both of us. Thank goodness, now he's gone.